Amen, amen. Thank you, Jackie and worship team. Good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. Okay, dads, stand up. Let's see all the dads. Let's do it. All you dads, stand up. Congratulations. Happy Father's Day. Well done, well done. Now get home and cut the lawn. Now let me state the obvious. I didn't show up for my shift last Sunday, and I showed up today and I've been fired. (laughs) Just like McDonald's, you know. So I'm here with you till next Sunday. I'll have more to say about uh, that next week, and I'm praying for you as a church in this time of transition. And uh, so open your Bibles. We're going to look at God's word. I came to preach, not just a yak. So open your Bibles to the book of Ruth, chapter 4. And we uh, have, uh, we're coming around the the final turn here in the book of Ruth. And I want to talk to you this morning about decision making, decision making. Often when people preach on Ruth, chapter 4, they spend a lot of time in the whole concept, which is beautifully illustrated and profoundly important of the kinsman redeemer and the typology that Boaz represents uh, looking ahead to Christ. And you've probably heard lots of sermons on that, so I'm not going to preach on that this morning, but I want to talk about decision making. I want to give you something that I hope will work on Monday mornings because I find that people often just don't make good decisions. And we see that in our world. And so Uh, We're going to look at this, and uh, my message is called Sealed with a Sandal, and uh, you'll hopefully understand why that makes a bit of sense here, but we're going to read 12 verses, so stay with me, Ruth chapter 4, it's a lot we're going to read, but it's important for the context and where we're headed this morning, okay? So this is God's word, Ruth chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. Just to give you a context, this is where uh, the ad- official administrative offices, this is the city hall, if you will, of the community. And this is where the judicial business of the community was conducted at the city gates. And so Boaz goes there to meet with others about this important issue he has. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, and sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and sat down here, so they sat down. And so they've got this council, if you will, there. Then he said to the Redeemer, this Redeemer, just by way of background, is the man who actually has the first right of refusal on property that Naomi owns that she will need to sell just so that she can function and exist, and uh, and he is going to, uh, he, or he has the capacity to f- perform this sort of redemptive act in buying that property. And so that's why we have this term redeem- redeemer. So they sat down. Then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who's come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of wine- land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me and that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. So in other words, if you don't buy that piece of property, I'm next in line, so I think you should buy it. Obviously, that will be helpful to Naomi. That will get her out of a difficult position. But if you're not going to buy it, then I'm next in line. Now, listen carefully to what it says next. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite. Now, pay careful attention to that verse because we're going to come back to that. Okay? The widow of the dead in order order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. In other words, when you take upon yourself this property, you're also going to receive, he is, we're reading here, you're going to receive Ruth is going to become your responsibility. But I'm going to come back to that and I'm going to share with you something that you may not have realized in the text here. Then the Redeemer said, this potential buyer of the property says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. In other words, 
I can't buy it for myself because if I'm going to get Ruth, Ruth is young and Ruth could actually uh, you know, have another child with somebody else, and and by marriage and by that child, you know, I, I actually my in, my property could be divvied up further to my own children, and I just I'm not prepared to do that. I don't want to imperil my own uh, my own affairs. So he says, "Take my right of redemption yourself." He's speaking to Boaz, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the matter of attesting in Israel. And the imagery there is, I'm going to give you my sandal, and in so doing, I am giving up my responsibility to walk on that land. That's the imagery, because it is now yours. And uh, this would be the equivalent today when we, you know, we have a deed signed and we get deed insurance and all of that. This is what was done. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malan. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malan, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. In other words, I'm going to take Ruth, I'm going to marry Ruth, we hope to have children, and that will perpetuate the line of this family. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, you, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. This is God's word. I have find that a lot of people have a hard time making decisions. And how you know that is if you say to somebody, you say, hey, do you have, hard, you know, do you have a hard time making decisions? And they go, well, yes and no. Right? That might be a bit of an indicator, right? They have a hard time making decisions. And what's especially hard, I find, is, you know, sometimes we can make decisions, but do we make good decisions? Especially in the big decisions of life, do we make good decisions? And we see embedded in the text here, Boaz making a good decision and executing that decision in a way that honors God and gives us some principles, some ingredients that I think are very helpful for making big decisions because big decisions are direction-setting, life-changing decisions. I'm not talking about, you know, you go through the drive through kind of decision. What am I going to get? I'm talking about the big, life-changing decisions. They're direction-setting. They're, they're therefore, in most cases, because of that, they're complicated, They might have a number of inputs into the decision, many considerations, and the potential for different outcomes. Listen carefully about decisions. If you only take away something, maybe this is the thing you need. Decisions set direction. Direction determines destiny. Let me say that again. Decisions set direction, and direction determines destiny. At about quarter after seven this morning, I got on the 401 at Cambridge, which is where I live, at 401 and Highway 97, and I got on, and I started heading west, and lo and behold, I ended up in London. And I didn't say, oh my goodness, here's the exit for London. How did that happen? I thought I was going, you know, I thought I was going to end up in PEI. Right? No, no, because I made a decision. That decision set me on a direction, and that direction then was determinative of my destination. I came along, and then I took the 402, and it said 402, and then lo and behold, I ended up in Sarnia. But in life, you would be shocked how often people don't correlate that together. I had a guy that worked for me one time. He came into my office. He said, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. He shut the door. I thought, oh, this is a big deal. And he said, I'm in a real pickle. And I said, oh, okay, what's the deal? And he said, uh, he said uh, 
uh, I'm, I'm in a financial, I'm in a difficult place. I said, oh, okay, what's going on? He says, well, for one, I got my credit card charged right to the max, and I'm barely making minimum payments. I said, oh, okay. And, uh, and then this came out of his mouth. I don't know how God would let this happen to me. <laughs> and so I said, can I see your credit card? And he said, yeah, I guess so. So he got his credit card out, and he handed it to me, and I looked at it. And I said, you know what's really strange? It doesn't say Yahweh on this credit card. It actually has your name on it. (laughs) See, every time you made a decision to use that, that set a direction, and that direction determined the destiny. And the destiny for you now is you are in financial trouble because you have not managed your finances. And then over a period of time, we helped him navigate out of that predicament. But good decisions are not to be looked at as acts of random chance with foggy outcomes. Good decisions are acts of informed and deliberate choice and reflection. We see that in what Boaz decides about Naomi and Ruth and then how he executes that decision. Boaz, in fact, is making a life-changing decision for himself and for Ruth and for Naomi. He is committing to taking Ruth as his wife in taking on this responsibility. And as we look at the story, we want to just determine what are some ingredients of good decision-making. Number one, first ingredient of good decision-making is pure motivation. Pure motivation. Uh, If you ever study philosophy, particularly at a, a graduate level, you will learn very quickly that uh, philosophy teaches that every human act is motivated by what? Does anybody know what it's motivated by? Love. Every human act is motivated by, oh, you would say, well, some are motivated by hate. Yeah, but that's love of self, ultimately, foundationally, right? That actually aligns with biblical truth. The world is motivated by self and the aggrandizement of self. Have you noticed that? The all about me syndrome, so that younger people pay attention sometimes to people that have no moral, uh, no substance, and yet they have, they are, you know what they're called now? Influencer. Well, what have they done that's substantial and significant? Oh, nothing, but they're an influencer, right? Uh, Back in 2001, the U.S. Army responding to the culture of our world. The U.S. Army used to have a a slogan. They always have a slogan in the U.S. Army, right? And the slogan before 2001, if anybody knows what the U.S. Army slogan was, does anybody know? Back in 2001 and earlier, it was, anybody know? Be all that you can be. And they said, that's not self-involved enough, and they came out with a new slogan in 2001, and does anybody know what that one was? An army of one. The problem with that is if you're an army of one, you ain't an army, you're alone. And you're going to get shot. And they realized very quickly that that was antithetical to everything that the army was about. That being in the army, if you were a man or woman in the army, it was about being part of something bigger than you are. And so they quickly moved away from an army of one and they came up with army strong, which meant collectively we're better than we are individually. So in the world we live, everything is about sort of self, right? So you have to say to yourself, the first question is, what is my motivation? Is my motivation in this decision about me? John 8, 29, let me read you a verse. And he who sent me is with me. This is Jesus speaking. He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Jesus says, in the things I do and say and the way I think, I act in a way, I respond in a way that is pleasing to my Father. Paraphrase, Jesus says, I always sense my Father's presence, guidance, and encouragement at all times because I'm walking in his ways. 
I'm walking in his ways. And if you want God's help in your decision making, you need to walk in his ways. If you feel like, man, I got this big life decision to make and God isn't here. God, where are you in this? I, 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 I'm not hearing, I'm not sensing you are here. That is a red flag. Check your motivation. Is you, are you walking in his ways? Motivation. Now, as a Christian, how do you live countercultural to the world? Well, Philippians 2, 3 tells us this. Very straight up. It couldn't be clear. Do nothing from selfish, anybody know what the next word is? Ambition or conceit. You know, you make it about yourself, right? But in humility, count others more important than yourself. That's when you know your heart is pure in your decision making. Is this about me, right? Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Do you know what the very next verse is about? That's Matthew 6, Do you know what the next verse is, Matthew 6, We often quote those two verses, but we don't marry them together. The thought is, is a combined thought. We pull the verse out. Seek ye first again, all is righteous. All these things will be added. Yeah, I like that verse. The next verse we also pull out and we quote it. But the two verses are married together. The next verse, and you know the verse, therefore, and therefore tells us that because of what has just been said in Scripture, this applies. So seek first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness, right? And everything else will get sorted out. That's the paraphrase. Therefore, so because of that, this, and this is what the next verse is, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. In other words, if you put God first, the kingdom of God first in your life, God is on the throne of your life, and when you have a big decision to make, guess what? You can trust God in the outcome because you put him first and foremost. You don't have to stand around worrying, oh, I made this decision, oh, if I make the wrong decision, oh, it's gonna be terrible. Regardless how it turns out, you can be okay with it because you knew God's mind and his will because you're walking in his ways and you have him first and foremost in your life. So important. If God's kingdom is first and foremost, it doesn't matter. Pure motivation. God's glory in his kingdom, first and foremost. That is the foundation for good decision making. Number two. Number two. A godly process. A godly process. Because, listen carefully, the end doesn't justify the means. God not only cares Where you end up, he cares about how you get there. Process matters to God. The Old Testament laws of worship, right, are incredibly oriented to process, how worship is to be conducted. In the New Testament, communion. We have this very clear process on communion and what we're to do, examine ourselves. And we practice that in a structured kind of way. Now, sometimes we read into traditions, sort of doctrine, and that's not wise, and we need to be careful. But not just what you decide, but how you get to that decision and you execute that decision is very important. And if the process, listen carefully, if the process doesn't honor the Lord, don't expect the outcome to be blessed of God. I have found time and time and time again, if I've got a big decision to make and my heart isn't pure in the motivation, and I'm talking about pure, I'm not talking 90% pure, I'm talking 100% pure in the motivation, and I don't execute the decision in a way that's gonna honor the Lord, forget about a good outcome, okay? Now, when the process is flawed, the content can still be good. Now let me explain this to you. This is grace and truth walking together, right? When grace is poorly exercised, there can still be truth. When grace is poorly exercised, there can still be truth, okay? So when people don't like the truth, now you're gonna be shocked to hear this, but this happens in churches sometimes, okay? When I was pastoring, sometimes we would have to make a decision. 
and it would be a good decision, and people would disagree with the decision. And because they couldn't go to war with the decision, because hopefully it was a biblical decision, it was a godly decision, they would say, well, I'm not upset about the decision. I just don't like, what do you think they said next? The way it was done. And sometimes the process isn't godly. It's not good. But that doesn't necessarily mean the decision's wrong, right? Uh, I went to visit a, uh, yesterday, yesterday we had a high school uh, class reunion, 40 years after we all graduated from high school. Uh, we all gathered at our, my house yesterday. So we, I don't know how many people showed up, maybe 20, 25 people, right? It turns out all these people I graduated with from high school with, they got old and fat. It's really crazy. I'm glad it wasn't me, you know? I was like, man, I look like that. I look worse than that. Some people actually look really good. But uh, we got, uh, you know, one of the guys that wasn't there was a friend of mine who became a pastor, and I hadn't seen him in like 30 years, and he lives a long ways away, and I happened to be in that city, and I looked him up, and I said, hey, I want to come and see you and see your church. And I said, oh, he said, okay, great. So I went to the church, and he hugs me, hey, and, and, uh, and uh, I said, how are you doing? Good, good. And he's, good, good, good. And he looks at me, he says, yeah, I used to be fat like you. What a friend we have. And I was like, oh, that's, 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 you know. Well, guess what? I didn't like the process, but he was true. I, I should lose some weight. Right? Right? So the content of what he said was true. I just didn't like the way he blurted it out, right? Okay? So you have to have a godly process. Let me give you a little illustration of that. Okay, you know, you're thinking, should I break off a painful friendship, a caustic friendship? And so you go to another friend and you, and you go to a, a separate friend and you say, I, ju I just need your input on this, right? And, and, and they want to be helpful. And what they should say to you is, you know, you should take inventory, like, is this trouble in this friendship? Do you own any of the trouble? Like, maybe some of this has to do with you. Right? But often they say, oh, yeah, you just break out the friendship, right? What, what, what they should say is, you know why your friendship doesn't work, and I love you, but it's because you're a taker, and you only call your friend when you need something. Man, and that hits you like a truck, Right? That hits you like a truck. And you go, oh, I didn't like the way they said that. But it could be true, right? The con content could be true. So when the content's true, don't be blinded by the process or don't be blinded by the hurt. Then I'll come back to that in a minute. Look at what Boaz does. He honors the process. He honors the process. He gathers together in verse one, right? He goes up to the city gates. He gathers everybody. He gathers the men. He says, sit down, I want to talk to you. Then he is truthful and he is gracious. He tells the truth about what is going on. He talks about what is happening. He talks about that this unnamed relative is first in line, but if he decides not to buy the field, then he will take it. And he says there, you know, the day that you buy the field from Naomi, you will also acquire Ruth the Moabite. It's very interesting. Pure motive. Now, Here's something I want to propose to you. If you have ever been around Jewish rabbis, which I've been around a number, this is a well-known and celebrated story, both in the Jewish faith and in the Christian faith. But there's a major difference in this story. If you hear most rabbis read this story, okay, most rabbis, when they read this story, they read this verse differently. They read this, that when you buy this field from the hand of Naomi, I, instead of you, will acquire Ruth. And you go back to the ancient Hebrew, and either reading is possible. But the Jews read this, the rabbis read this verse, and they say that Boaz is saying, 
relative, if you buy this field, that's fine, but I want you to know up front, if you buy this field, I am still gonna marry Ruth. I'm gonna marry Ruth. I care about Ruth, I love Ruth, I'm gonna marry Ruth. So you're gonna buy this field, but you're going to lose Ruth, and I'm gonna marry Ruth, and if we have a child, then that field ultimately will revert to that child, and you will lose that field. So you need to know that right up front. Very clear about that. It goes back to number one, right, the pure motive. So not only does Boaz have pure motive, he honors the process. He says, listen, this field is yours. You can buy it. But if you don't buy it, I want to buy it. And regardless of what happens, if you buy it, I am still going to marry Ruth, and then technically that will go, so you will lose the field. Which makes more sense if you study the text that that actually is the reading. And Christian scholars are very divided on this, so let me just say that up front. But this relative has no sense that this could be a possibility. But when Boaz says, here's what's going to happen, the relative immediately says, oh yeah, I don't want to do that. You move ahead. I hand it over to you. This is yours. You take it. And in big decisions, friends, let me just say, don't just think about outcomes, but how you're going to get there. Are you, do you have a process that, that God will honor your godliness in the process? And God honors Boaz's godliness in the process, and God will honor your godliness in the process as well. Third thing you need in making big decisions, the right timing. The right timing. Have you ever uh, made a decision, but the timing was wrong? Yeah. And you're like, yeah, you know, I think this is right, but timing is wrong. Because right timing plus a uh, right decision plus wrong time generally leads to confusion, right? Generally leads to confusion. At the end of chapter two of the book of Ruth, we re read that Ruth worked in the fields of Boaz for the barley and then the wheat harvest. That's likely about four months, April through July, okay? Further, we know that Boaz has known about Ruth before he meets her working in, her, in, in the field, probably five to six months. Now, Naomi, mother-in-law Naomi, waited. Boaz waited. Na Naomi wanted a secure f future for Ruth and for herself, right? Boaz, I think, friends, was captivated by this woman Ruth, her great character, her beauty, her humility, I think from the day he first saw her. But he waited, and Naomi and Ruth were dirt poor, but they waited. They didn't push, they waited. Uh, Boaz, he could have afforded to redeem Ruth right away. It wasn't like, yeah, I'm saving up every paycheck to buy an engagement ring, right? He was a man of means, but he waited. He waited. Galatians 4.4 4 tells us about the importance of waiting. You might know the verse. But when the fullness of time had come, God did what? Sent forth his son. God waited. Big decisions need to be made, listen carefully, when our spiritual and emotional tanks are full. The outcome of that decision, God may say, this is what I want you to decide, and frankly, God may ask you to make a decision that will drain your tank, right? So you need to have a full tank at the outset. And if you are really unsure of the timing of the decision, then it may not be the right timing. Now, let me just say this. Fear is not a reason or to wait on a decision. Fear is not. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, or some translations say, or good thinking. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear is not of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is appropriate, but not just fear of all of the stuff in the world. So fear is not a reason to wait. 
But sometimes waiting is so that God can do a work in you because the decision that you're going to have to make is going to be maybe disorienting, maybe reorienting, so significant that God's going to do a work in you. I sold my business. I was in the, in the jewelry business. I'm a goldsmith by training, believe it or not. And I have done lots of time sitting at a bench doing goldsmithing. You say, wow, you don't have any jewelry. That's because I went into ministry and I had to pawn it. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I sold my business in 1991 with a very clear direction that God had called us to go into ministry. 1991. Sold my business. Man, I said to a friend of mine, hey, can I come and work for you just till I get all this sorted out? He said, sure. You know how long I worked for him? Three years. Doing something I didn't want to do. Do you know why? Because God knew that I needed to be humbled greatly. And he did. He did. So I went from being a goldsmith, owning my own jewelry store, fine jewelry store, making beautiful things, sold my business. I go to work for my friend. He owns a plumbing business. Yeah, I think I can get that out of there for you, ma'am. What is it again? It's a Lego, eh? Yeah, no, that doesn't feel like a Lego. I'll leave it at that. God had to humble me. The timing was not right. I look back and I say, I would not be of use to the Lord until he humbled me. Paul waited and served God and grew in his faith at least 14 years after he became a Christ follower before he entered missionary service. The timing was not right. But when it was right, it was right. And sometimes the best decision is to get stronger in Christ where you think you may be stuck and you may no longer feel stuck but strong and the timing is right for that decision. Number four, truth. What are the ingredients of a good decision? Truth. Facts are our friends and as I've just said, fear is not. What is wisdom? You know, we say, oh, that person's so wise. Oh, I know this woman. She's just so wise. I know this, this man, you know, he's just so wise. Wisdom is the skillful application of knowledge. There's plenty of people with tons of knowledge. You can get information and knowledge in three clicks of your, your smartphone, right? Hey, who was that actor that was in that uh, movie? There? Oh, hold on. Shh. Right? You find out anything. But that's not wisdom, that's simply knowledge. Wisdom is the skillful application of the knowledge, right? Proverbs 2.6 tells us this, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding, right? How to apply it. And it is consciously developed wisdom by way of a life lived in deep relationship with God. And that's why the beginning of that wisdom, Proverbs 9.10, is the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom, right? And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The fear of the Lord, what is that? It's this deep abiding, holy reverence and respect for the Lord and for his word. So trust him and listen to him and obey him. Godly process, being gracious, that's wisdom. Embracing truth, it includes the process as we talked about. Now where do we get wisdom? Both the knowledge, the truth, and the skill to apply it. Well, James 1.5 tells us. Where do you get wisdom? If anyone lacks wisdom, he is to do what? Ask of the Lord, and he giveth, giveth forth abundantly. Uh, he, he, he wants to help you. Now, wisdom comes from three conduits, I would say. Okay? Three conduits. The first one, no surprise, God's word. Right? Uh, James, a little farther along in the book of James, in James chapter 3, right? He said the wisdom from above is first pure. You can trust it. Peaceable, gentle, open to reason. Psalm 119, 105. 
God's word is a lamp, what? Unto my feet, stop. So that means God's word will tell me where I'm at right now. It's a lamp unto my feet. It will orient me right now where I am. And then the psalmist writes, God's word is a lamp unto my feet and what? Light unto my path. It's going to direct me in where I'm to go. Not only will it orient me, give me a starting point, understand where I'm at, where, where you know, the here and now, but it will direct me as I move forward. Psalm 1, quickly, if you have your Bible, quickly, turn over to Psalm 1, quickly. I want you to see this so, such powerful truth in God's word. Psalm 1, verse 1. You know these verses, but let's look at them for a second. If you need wisdom. Blessed is the man who walks not. In other words, you know what? If you're going to be blessed, you don't do this. So blessed is the person, the man, the woman who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Let me ask you this. Who is sitting at your decision-making table? Nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Did you notice the progression there? When you start drinking out of poisoned wells to try and gain wisdom... The first thing you do is you walk, right? Right? Hey, you got a minute? I just wanted to ask you something. What do you think about this? Next thing you know, you're standing and talking, and then you're sat down at the table of people who do not think in the way and have the mind of the Lord. But, verse 2, but, don't do that, but, his delight is in the law of the Lord. In other words, you want to be a blessed person? Blessed people make good decisions, godly decisions. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Get into your Bible, get your Bible into you. He is like a tree planted by streams of water. You'll have something to drink in when you're planted by a stream of water that yields its fruit in season. Who determines the seasons? God. You'll, you'll bear fruit when God says you'll bear fruit in, in your season. And that's determined by God. You can't crank that up. You trust God in that, right? And its leaf does not wither. You will be able to withstand the droughts and disappointments and despair that life brings to all of us. You won't wither, oh, I don't know how I'm going to go on. No, because you've, you've drank deeply out of this stream, right? In all that he does, he prospers. In all that he does, selai is the Hebrew word there. It actually means, that the most literal thing is that, you know what? You will steadily move forward towards success. You keep at it. So God's word is the first place of wisdom. The second place of wisdom is the Holy Spirit, right? Because Jesus said, John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes to you, he will lead you into all truth. Now the danger of the spirit is some people have taken this and gone in a direction that I think does not honor God nor his word because the spirit never contradicts the word because the spirit gave the word. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The word came from God, Father, Son, the triune Godhead. So the spirit of God in your life is never gonna contradict the word of God. And when people say to me, I think God wants me to do this, I, there's times when I have had to say to them as a pastor, he absolutely does not. Well, that's what he seems to be saying to me. Oh yeah, Where do, does he say that in here? Because in here it says, don't leave your wife. Right? I had to say that to a very close friend of mine years ago. He said, my kids, you know, they, they say that I should leave her. And I said, oh really? Because you call yourself a Christian and the Bible says that you should stick it out. You know, I haven't spoken to him since. But I loved him enough to tell him the truth. So the Spirit never contradicts the Word. So the Word shapes our experience, not the other way around. Well, I think God wants me to do this. And I'm pretty sure I think that's what he's saying to me. Now I'm going to try and prove it somehow with his Word. No, no, no. The Word always shapes our experience, friends. 
confirm the Spirit's work in your life through the Word of God. Third one, where do we get wisdom from? We get it from God's people, right? Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, <clears throat> excuse me, they exceed, or there is wi- there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors, the old King, uh, New King James says. So the mind of God can often and does often come through his people, right? Now, here's the key. You got to pick the right people. You got to pick the right people, right? Seek out people who will not focus on what you want to hear. That's sometimes what we do in big decisions. I'm going to ask, you know, so-and-so, because they really like me, and they're so nice. You know what the problem might be? They may tell you what you want to hear. Seek out people who will tell you what they believe God wants you to hear. What does God want? And I've had... People, men in my life, and I've said, hey, man, I want to ask you something. And they've said something, you know, in the context of I know they love me and they want God's best for me. And they say, Steve, here's the deal. And I'm like, ah, I wish you hadn't said that. That's not what I wanted to hear, but it's probably what I needed to hear. Right? Right? Faithful are the what? Wounds of a, of a friend, right? But the kisses of an enemy are profuse. Bible tells us. You need friends that will love you enough and have enough courage to tell you the truth in the big decisions in life. And what that tells me, friends, is somebody who does not tell you the truth in a loving way that's kind and gracious is not really being your friend at that moment. Not really being your friend. Four questions as you face a big decision. Is my motivation pure? Think, if this decision goes this way, who will get the glory? That's how you know if your motivation is pure. That's an acid test. If this decision goes the way that I've decided, will God be glorified? Because if your motivation is impure, it's hard to end up there. So the first question, is your motivation pure? Is your motivation pure? Second one, am I honoring God in the process, right? Because both the end of this decision and the means to get there are important to God. Is the timing right? Is the timing right? Have I taken time to hear from the Lord on this? Have I waited? Boaz, he waited. Naomi waited and Ruth waited. And do I have a full spiritual tank that I'll be able to respond in a way that God directs. And the third one is this. Am I embracing wisdom? Is this of the mind of God? And if you walk through those four steps, I believe your big decisions can be good decisions and you can trust God in the trade-off, whatever comes. Amen? Whatever comes. Even if it's like, ah, that didn't really seem to work out. That's okay. If you did that, then you can trust God in the trade-off. And God is good. Amen? God is so good. Because God, in his timing, in his wisdom, when the fullness of time came, he sent forth his son. What a great decision he made, amen? In eternity past. And I hope you've experienced the reality of that in your life. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We love you. Father, may we be like Boaz. As we decide to make big, life-changing, direction-setting, destiny-determining decisions, may we have a pure heart. May our motivation be pure. Father God, may we operate, function. May people look and say, well, we are walking in your ways. That not only does the destination, but the journey there honor you. Father God, will we embrace truth? Facts are our friends, Lord. You are a God of truth. We know that. May we do it in the right time, having sought you and listened for you and walked in your ways. And Father, may all that we do prosper for your glory alone, for you are worthy of all glory and honor this day and forevermore. Amen and amen.